Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Red Sea. And if you promise not to get seasick, I promise I won't either. Um, this morning we have a talk on Lawrence of Arabia, the Bedouins, an allied victory in World War I. This afternoon at 2 o'clock we are having the movie Lawrence of Arabia, 1962, ranked as one of the top 10 films of all time. And I have a very, a critically important piece of business that I need to do before we get moving here, and that is guest services. Anthony has said that they are going to be able to have popcorn this afternoon for the movie. I knew that would be the reaction. But we need to know about how many, because we expect we'll have more people than we will have in the nighttime movie. So if you want to have, if you're going to be at the movie today, raise your hand and let me get a real quick count. Oh gosh. I count about 400 people. Um, carry the one. Okay. It sounds like almost everybody wants to go. So that'd be great. We'll have popcorn. Great movie. This is a movie that was made back in the days when you did a really long movie. They have an intermission. So the plan is that they will have some refreshments and uh, there'll be popcorn during the movie, but refreshments during the intermission and that sort of thing. So I do encourage you to be there. In fact, one of the books that I recommended to you from the reading list we have is Lawrence in Arabia by Scott Anderson. It, was, it came out just last year. It's a new book. Um, a lot of books came out related to the First World War period because it's the 100th anniversary. Uh, it's an excellent book, and my wife said that between that book and my talk and the movie, Lawrence of Arabia, she felt like she really knew what was going on then. So uh, I think that it's a good idea to watch the movie after the talk. All right. Lawrence of Arabia, The Bedouins and Allied Victory in the First World War. Uh, this afternoon is the movie. Tomorrow morning we will have Mysteries of the Nabataeans and Petra in preparation for the visit to Petra in Jordan. And then that afternoon, tomorrow afternoon, we'll have the permanence of ancient Egypt. That's going to be kind of a general talk about Egypt and why it has the longest history in the world and some of the particular aspects of what makes that such a fascinating and mysterious place. And then the next afternoon, we will have Pharaoh's temples and tombs. That's intended to give you more specifically an orientation of what you can expect to see, help you give, a, give you an understanding of what Luxor the Valley of the Kings is going to be like, so uh, in preparation for that. I will remind you, too, on the morning of the 3rd, which is a Sunday morning, um, we will have a talk in here at 10 o'clock. I won't be doing the presentation, but Ava, our ship photographer, will be talking about icons. She's an artist and an art major, and she's going to give a presentation. Um, icons aren't just religious art. There's a, it's much more complicated than that, so she'll be introducing you to that. But today, we want to talk about Lawrence of Arabia, the Bedouins, and an Allied victory in the First World War. I keep flashing this um, web address up here. This is where the videos will be when we get back to uh, Mexico and Carolyn has a chance to put them up. All right. In 1900, at the start of the 20th century, there were six great empires that existed in Europe. Russia obviously extended beyond that, but much of what we think of as Eastern Europe was controlled by the Russian Empire. By 1920, by the aftermath of the First World War, four of those six empires would be completely gone. The Russian Empire, the, Otto the Ottoman Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and the German Empire would be gone, never to return. There were countries left behind, but not empires. And two of those empires, the British Empire and the French Empire, would never be as great after that. This first 20 years, the First World War was a, uh, an a, astonishing time in terms of changes in the world. Now, there are several things that led to the First World War. In preparation for talking about uh, what happened in the Middle East during this time, I need to give you some background on World War I. When I've done this talk a couple of times before, I've had people come up to me and said, I had no, I did not remember anything about what caused the First World War. You need to understand that to understand what happens later. The, in 1871, there had been a war between um, Germany, but between Prussia, as it was called then, and the French, the Franco-Prussian War. 1871, because the Prussians won that war, they took over territory. That was the start of the German Empire in 1871. They were the baby of all the empires, although militarily they were one of the strongest, and they had huge ambition for expanding their empire, and they're called empires because these countries not only controlled large parts of Europe, 
but they also controlled large parts of Africa and Latin America. They had colonies in the West, uh, colonies in Asia. It was extraordinary how far some of these reached. After the founding of the German Empire, there was a strong motivation by all these empires to be competitive. And one of the ways they were competitive is they kept trying to set up treaties with each other of mutual protection. We went through a period of time where everybody and their brother was signing a treaty after 1871. In 1878, Russia had a war with the Ottoman Empire, and so the Ottoman Empire turned to Germany as an ally. That's why they ended up on Germany's side during the First World War. But Germany and Austro-Hungary signed a treaty in 1879. In 1885, Russia and France signed a treaty. In 1904, France and Britain. In 1907, Britain and Russia. In 1907, later in that year, the Triple Entente, as it was called, of Britain, France, and Russia. Russia pledged to protect Serbia, the small country that had broken off of the Ottoman Empire. Britain promised to protect the small country of Belgium, and on and on. Everybody thought they would protect their, their um, imperial ambitions by getting some of these other great powers to be their allies. During the same period of time, especially in Eastern Europe, there were a lot of minor conflicts. In fact, they had gotten so used to having some kind of war going on somewhere that they, they weren't really concerned about having a war anymore. That was one of the problems that led to what's been called the Great War, the First World War. And then in 1890, a critical thing happened because there was a new chancellor uh, came in, or excuse me, a new um, Kaiser or king came into the German Empire, Wilhelm II, and Wilhelm II did not like the person who was the chancellor in Germany, Otto von Bismarck. You know that name, Bismarck. Otto von Bismarck had been the chancellor of Germany for many years, and he alone had the, the wisdom and the sensibility as a, to be a primary stabilizing force amongst all these powers. But because the new Kaiser, Wilhelm II, didn't like Bismarck, he got rid of him. And that one thing that was keeping sort of things in balance, that one man, uh, was not in the picture anymore. So that's the setting. So what actually precipitated the start of the war? This is uh, the crown prince of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Um, this is Franz Ferdinand of Austria. He was the nephew of Franz Joseph, who was the Austro-Hungarian emperor. He was visiting Sarajevo in 1914, and on June 28, 1914, a Serbian fanatic named Gavrilo Princip, Serbian nationalist. Serbia had broken off from the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire was considered the sick old man of Europe, and Greece, Mon uh, the, the Serbia, Bulgaria, they had all succeeded in throwing off the control of the Ottoman Empire. Now, Austro-Hungary had ambitions to take over these countries after the Ottomans uh, were driven off. And in fact, in 1908, they had, they had launched what was called the Pig War. There's a romantic name for it, the Pig War, where they had annexed Montenegro and Herzegovina, which were separate um, sort of principalities at that time. When they did that, Serbia complained about it. Serbia by that time was free. The reason was because there were a number of ethnic Serbians living in those areas, and the, nation, the government of Serbia didn't think that Austro-Hungary had a right to that. Well, they complained to the other big powers, to Germany and the others, and all the others took Austro-Hungary to task and said, no, no, back off. So Austro-Hungary was mad at the Serbians anyway. Well, when Gavril Princip uh, assassinated Franz Joseph and his wife, they were visiting Sarajevo, in modern what we know as Yugoslavia, and he and a group of other Serbian nationalists, radicals, from a group called the Black Hand, they assassinated Franz Joseph and his wife. He walked up to the car as they drove by and shot him. It's really kind of crazy because they had driven through the same route the other direction just a short time earlier, and they, somebody tried to throw a bomb in their car, and they escaped that. Well, <laughs> later on, they went to a function, and they came back out of the car, and the driver went right back the same direction and ended up having the heir apparent of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and his wife assassinated. Uh, this is an actual photograph that was taken of them arresting Gavril Princip. Well, as a result of that, because especially because Austro-Hungary was angry at Serbia and wanted to get back at Serbia, 
they accused the Serbian government of being behind this plot and being behind the assassination of the heir apparent, Franz Joseph. So, um, the Franz Ferdinand. And so they issued an ultimatum. So this is July 1914. They issued an ultimatum to Serbia that would in effect have, have completely compromised any national sovereignty or independence they had. They said they want their police to come in and take control of the country. They wanted to be responsible for capturing and uh, punishing the people who were responsible for this, and on and on. Well, Serbia was actually considering this, but it's clear that Austro-Hungary didn't really want them to give in to this. They just wanted this to be a pretext for creating a war. And so, on 28th of July of 1914, later that same month, uh, Austro-Hungary declares war on Serbia. Well, because of all those treaties I mentioned a minute ago, Russia, the Empire of Russia, had promised to protect Serbia. And so they declared war, or they actually started mobilizing their troops. When they started mobilizing their troops, Germany, which is the, the strongest continental power militarily, they declared war on Russia. Well, when they declared war on Russia, the French had a treaty with the Russians, so the French declared war on Germany, and therefore on Austro-Hungary. Well, when they declared war, then the um, Germans, who did not like the French, they had had the Pr Franco-Prussian War, and they knew that it was only a matter of time before they had trouble, so they had a specific plan in place called the Schlieffen Plan. The Germans had a plan where instead of going up against the, the, um, the barriers and the various fortifications that the French had along the French and German border, they swept up, in, like overnight in early August, through Belgium in order to try to get around the fortifications of the Maginot Line, the various fortifications that the French had, and to come down into France that way. Well, when they invaded Belgium to get through Belgium to get to the French and to try to capture Paris, the British had promised to defend the small country of Belgium, and so the British declared war on the Germans. So one step after another, and this all happened in a matter of just a few weeks, one country after another got sucked into this conflict until every one of the major countries, all of the empires and virtually all of the countries in Europe got involved in this. Japan had a treaty with Britain, so Japan declared war on Germany. Italy, while they had a treaty with Austro-Hungary and Germany, their treaty only allowed for them to get involved if it was a war of defense. And Italy got off of that by saying, well, you guys attack first, or you declare war first. Later on, they actually sided with the British and the French and the Russians. Bulgaria sided with the British, French, and Russians, and on and on. Every And, and the, the other difficulty, the reason why this was a world war, is, for instance, when the British declared war on Germany and Austro-Hungary, that meant New Zealand, Australia, Canada, all of the possessions of the British Empire were automatically involved in that war. The same thing was true because all of these other nations, war got to Africa because Germany had various properties that they controlled in Africa, as did the British, etc. So that's why it became a world war, even though it was based on what was happening in Europe. These are the various empires and how they lined up. The German Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, Bulgaria sided with them, the Ottoman Empire, uh, because they had been looking to Germany to protect them, because they were not even strong enough to protect their own properties, all of those became known as the Central Powers. And Central because Germany and Austro-Hungary were right in the middle. The Triple Entente, as it was called in that day, which was France, Russia, and Great Britain, later on were joined by Italy, Romania, Serbia, Greece, and various other countries. Portugal also. Spain stayed out of it, a few other countries stayed out of it. The Scandinavian countries didn't get involved in it. Um, but everybody was at war. What happened immediately as the Germans launched the Schlieffen Plan, and the Schlieffen Plan called for them to enter up through, um, through Belgium here. This is, uh, if you can see the picture down here at the bottom. They did not attack straight across the border into France, but rather swept north through Belgium. The Schlieffen Plan, the military plan, called for them to conquer Paris in 42 days. It was an exact timeline. And they believed if they could conquer Paris and therefore get the French to surrender in 42 days under the Schlieffen Plan, that that would be faster than the Russian armies could mobilize effectively, because Russia was notoriously disorganized and fairly primitive. 
And they thought if we can defeat the, uh, the French so quickly, we can then turn our forces to the east and fight the Russians because they had a two-front war. Well, the Russians actually got their act together faster than anybody thought they would. When the, uh, the, the Kaiser, Wilhelm, uh, Kaiser Wilhelm II was so confident of this plan, he said, you know, I will have Paris for lunch and St. Petersburg for dinner. Everybody, both sides, thought that this war would end in a matter of a few months. Five months was the projection that both sides were making because Serbia thought, I've got the Russians on my side. They have the largest standing army in the world. Austro-Hungary said, you know, the, the German military is the most powerful in the world. Britain comes into it. They have by far the largest navy in the world. Everybody thought they would win, and they thought it would take five months. Well, when the Germans invaded through Belgium and came down toward Paris, they got, the, at first they were very, very effective, but they were moving so fast, they exhausted themselves, they outran their lines of supply, and so the French and the British expeditionary force had gotten there by then. They decided they are gonna, they're gonna establish a line at the Marne River, and they stopped the German advance at the Marne River, and the Germans are trying to collect themselves. It ended up that that um, western front at the Marne River became probably the worst stalemate in the history of any warfare. This is what it looked like. Um, again, this is the River Marne, um, the, the River Somme here. These dark areas are the areas of battles. They ended up, this line right here was a trench line. They con the armies confronted each other, neither one could make any advances. They dug in, they dug trenches. These trenches reached from the Alps, the Swiss Alps, all the way to the English Channel. And there were so many soldiers there that in these hundreds of miles of trenches, there was an average of one soldier every four inches between the two lines. They dug fortified uh, bunkers underneath these things that were able to withstand bombardment. They ended up in a stalemate there for four years, 1,500 days. And it, one of the problems that they had is that uh, they were still trying to use, we are talking about this earlier, they are still trying to use Napoleonic tactics at first against modern warfare. For instance, when the Germans swept up through Belgium, the French thought that was a, a feint, that it wasn't a real attack, that they were going to attack across the line. So the French sent their armies directly against the German border. Well, they very quickly discovered they were not prepared for the effect of machine guns, which had never been used in major war before, nor long-range sniper rifles. The French lost 27,000 soldiers in one day. Just decimated their forces. And they had to then retreat. That's why they then had to back up to the River Marne. So this trench warfare established in the Western Front, this horrendous, from, they were still trying to use tactics, uh, the British were especially notorious for this, of just sending their soldiers up out of the trenches right into the face of machine guns, these, these mass charges. And they would lose enormous numbers of soldiers all the way along. For instance, uh, the Battle of Ypres, I start talking and they get ahead of my notes. Let me move forward here. I've got some specific numbers. The Battle of Ypres, there actually were three battles of Ypres along the, the Western Front. Um, the first one in October 1914, and they had two others later on. The third Battle of Ypres ended up lasting for nine months in 19, February 1916. 300,000 dead and 750,000 wounded in one battle. We then had the Battle of the Song of uh, Verdun down here. The Battle of Verdun ended up with, um, uh, let me find my notes. It lasted four and a half months. The British lost 20,000 dead and 40,000 wounded on the first day. In total, they lost 750,000 men in the Battle of Verdun. And it lasted, uh, over two million people fought in that one battle. The Battle of the Somme, they, uh, well, similar kinds of numbers. They were losing hundreds of thousands of soldiers in each battle and gaining no territory. 
they would move the lines a few hundred yards and then in fairly short order they'd get pushed back. This was the horrible stalemate. By the end of the war, nine million dead. The world had never seen a war as devastating as this, and they were gaining nothing out of all of this. Similarly, on the Eastern Front, let me back up there, the Russians, the first major battle of the Russian war, because as I say, the Russians got their act together and they actually attacked in what's called the Tannenberg Forest, and they lost an entire 350,000 man army. Almost half of them killed and the other half just running helter-skelter. The Germans defeated them. And so the Germans said, well, this is working out better than we thought. Because of all of this, the British and the French, but especially the British, were saying, we need to find some place that we can break this stalemate. And they started thinking the place to do it is against the weakest of the central power uh, empires, and that is the Ottoman Empire, the sick man of Europe. And because the Russians asked for help from the British, they decided that they were going to assist the Russians and try to find a weak place in the Ottoman Empire. And if they could defeat the Ottoman Empire, they thought that would be a way to start winning against Austro-Hungary and Germany. So this is Turkey, the Ottoman Empire, these Bulgaria, Greece, etc. This is the Dardanelles. If you've ever been to Istanbul, Istanbul is right there. And there's a narrow, uh, the narrow body of water there called the Bosphorus, which is a canal sort of thing. It's not actually a canal, but it's between Asia and Europe. It's the joining place of Asia and Europe. Well, south of that, there's another area here called the Dardanelles, and there's a tiny peninsula there called the Gallipoli Peninsula. Well, Russia is up here, and Russia was saying to the British, look, I, the only way we can get goods by sea is through this area, which was all controlled by their enemy, the Ottoman Empire. So if you could come and help break this uh, blockade, we can get supplies and we can be of more help to you. Plus, they thought if we could win a big battle against the Ottoman Empire, we might get a foothold in that area. So in April of 1915, they launched the Gallipoli Battle, or the Gallipoli Disaster as I've called it. This is what the peninsula looks like up close. In April of 1915, the British, uh, particularly the Australian and New Zealand contingencies, or what's called the ANZAC, the Australian New Zealand Army Corps, they were the primary uh, people in, in, that landed at these beaches on the Gallipoli Peninsula. This is what it looked like when they landed. Okay, they landed here, and then on the southern tip of it, nine months later, these dotted lines are where they ended up. In fact, this was probably the worst planned, least prepared for battle in modern history. They literally had not done any surveying of the territory. They said that the only indication they had of what the land, the geography was like there, was based upon tourist guides that they had gotten in Egypt. <laughs> the only instructions they really gave for the soldiers that landed there was they handed out leaflets telling them what to expect when all the Turkish soldiers surrendered because they believed, since it was the sick old man of Europe and Turkey did not have a very good reputation, they're the Turkish soldiers, the Ottoman soldiers, of, of militarily, they thought it was just, we're gonna walk up there and they're all gonna surrender. Well, it turned out that these hills, along the coastlines and along these areas, the Turkish soldiers were well dug in, they were well prepared, they were well led. In fact, one of the commanders for the Turkish army there was a man named Mustafa Kemal, who later would become Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, the founder of the modern nation of Turkey. He was one of the commanders here and one of the people responsible. The Turkish won a great battle here. It was the, the greatest victory that the Turks had during the whole First World War. The Allied forces suffered a terrible battle. In fact, um, April 25th is still Anzac Day. It is, it is the, you know, the uh, Memorial Day in Australia and New Zealand. And they just recently celebrated it. And in fact, it's their 100th anniversary. It's, it's 100 years ago. In fact, 100 years and a week ago was when this happened. And so this horrendous uh, result. Now, some of the groups that landed there in terms of the British attack lost 70% of their troops in trying to land on the beaches. Some of them lost 60%. There was one group that had 1,012 soldiers in one brigade. One guy survived these attacks. It was a horrendous disaster. <laughs> They finally, after nine months, they decided they had to retreat. And so they left there. 
But the Gallipoli campaign, on top of all the horrors and the difficulties they had in the stalemate of the Western trenches and the Eastern Front where the Russians were not doing well, the British Empire especially said, we gotta find some place that we can win, something, because nothing is happening for us. So they started looking at other parts of the Ottoman Empire. Ottoman Empire at that time was all of Turkey, part of Eastern Europe, although they've been pushed out of much of it, um, down into what we know of today as Iraq, Syria, Israel, the Hejaz, which is the western coast of uh, Saudi Arabia, of the Saudi uh, Peninsula, and we're right there, right now. <laughs> the British, technically, Egypt and some of these other areas were part of their Ottoman Empire, but the British had moved in and were just running things, even though technically it still belonged to the Ottoman Empire. So the British, since they were located in Egypt, protecting the Suez Canal, which had been built in the 1860s, so that, and that was very important to them, they said, what can we do to try to fight the Ottoman Empire? And somebody wisely said, well, you know, we've got all these Arabian, all these Arabs, none of whom liked Turkey. Because what had happened is they're under the control of the Ottoman Empire, but more and more and more, especially in the late 1800s, the Ottoman Empire had started to focus more on their Turkish roots, not the, and, and to the negation or the, the neglect of the Arabic part of their empire, and they had started getting more liberal from a religious point of view, so they were not representing conservative Islam anymore. Well, the Arabs, a different ethnic group. Remember I told you, Turkey and the Arabs are a completely different ethnic group. They speak different languages. The Arabs were saying, they're not us, they don't care about us, and they are not well representing Islam. But the problem that, that the British had was when they thought, well, what if we can get the Arabs to fight for us? There was no central authority amongst the Arabic tribes. These are just some of the Arabic tribes, and the Arabic tribes fought against each other more than they fought against anybody else. They were very tribal, very um, ethnocentric in terms of their group, that's why I told you that in Islam, there's always been a controversy of does the caliph, does the successor to Muhammad need to be from his tribe? Because tribal connections were critically important. So they looked at all this mess of all these tribes and said, how in the world are we going to get them to join us and fight on our side? The British did. Well, they said there's one thing they all have in common. They all look to the city of Mecca. This says Mecca because this is a, you know, it's not an English map. But Mecca and Medina, the great holy sites of Islam, all of the Arabic tribes were Islamic, and all of them looked at these cities as being central to their faith. They all had that in common. So they decided, if we can get the person who is the leader of the, this area, there actually was an area called the Hejaz. Um, the red outline was the traditional location of the Hejaz in Saudi Arabia. Later on, a kingdom was declared of the Hejaz, which is this green. It included Mecca, Medina, and a number of other significant cities. Well, it so happened that there was one man who was the emir or prince of these areas, had been appointed that. He was from the tribe that historically had always been in charge of this area, the Hejaz, and yet he had been appointed by the sultan. But he was one of the ones who was most disappointed in the way the Turkish the Turkish government, the Ottoman Empire, had been treating Arabs and had been treating the Islamic faith. His name was Hussein bin Ali. He was the emir of the Hejaz, the sheriff of Mecca. If you ever see the name Sharif or Sheriff, it's either S-H-A-R-I-F or sometimes E-R-I-F, like Omar Sharif. Sharif means a descendant of Muhammad, and that is a sign of honor. So anybody with Sharif in their name or in their title, it means they are a descendant of the, from the family. The Hashemite kingdom, and it's called the Hashemites because that's really the tribe of Hashim, they were descended through a different line from Muhammad's grandfather. So they were of the same blood. They were a part of the Quraysh tribe that Muhammad came from. Well, the British realized that Hussein bin Ali did not like the Ottoman Empire. And he was one of the people, probably the only person, who had sufficient authority as a voice to get the Arabic tribes to join with the British and their allies in the war. Now, Hussein bin Ali had three sons. He actually had four sons. The fourth one was quite young at this point, so he doesn't, he's not a major player. His oldest son was Ali bin Hussein, 
Later on, he would succeed his father as king of the Hejaz. We'll discuss that. The second one is Abdullah bin al-Hussein. And Abdullah al um, bin al-Hussein became first the emir and later the king of Jordan. In fact, the Hashemite rulers, Jordan is still called the Hashemite kingdom of Jordan. I'll mention that later. And then the third son, who for the sake of the First World War was most important, is Faisal bin Hussein bin Ali al-Hashimi. He was the one that worked with Lawrence of Arabia in leading the Arab troops against the Ottoman Empire. He became king of Syria for a couple of months until a French came along and threw him out. I'll tell you why. And then later became the king of Iraq for 12 years. So this family ended up producing a number of very significant rulers in the Middle East. Well, the British approached Hussein bin Ali and they said, if you will get the Arab tribes together to fight on the side of the Allies against the Ottoman Empire, then we will give you what you want. And what Hussein bin Ali wanted was an Arab nation. He wanted to have a unified nationality that would be representative of all the Arab peoples so that somebody like the Ottoman Turks could no longer tell them what to do. Well, between July and January, July 1915 um, and January 1916, there was a series of letters written between Hussein bin Ali and Sir Henry McMahon. McMahon was the primary British representative in the Middle East. He was the high commissioner in Egypt, where they had their, their headquarters for the region. They wrote back and forth, and they came to an agreement and there's a specific letter that was written on the 24th of October, 1915, in which the British promised Hussein bin Ali that if they fought on the side of the Allies and they were victorious in the war, they would be given a national Arab homeland. In fact, the exact wording in that letter was, Great Britain is prepared to recognize and support the independence of the Arabs within the territories and limits and boundaries proposed by the Sharif of Mecca. This is the Arabian Peninsula. This is what the British promised the Arabs through Hussein bin Ali. That all of this area, and it's specifically delineated in the correspondence, that from the southern border of what was Turkey over through the edge of Iraq, down through the Persian Gulf, all of the Arabian Peninsula, all of the Levant, would all become one Arab nation. And they put it in writing. Hussein believe them. Well, once they agreed that the, uh, we'll come back to that. Once they agreed that the Arabs were going to fight on the side of the British, the British had to figure out how to organize this. How are we going to liaison with these Arab troops? Because they were going to helter-skelter. They were very hard to control. In fact, one of the problems they had, the way the Arabs had always done warfare is they'd fight a battle, and if they won, then they would collect up all the booty and stuff they could, and then they'd go home. You know, they were not a standing army, and you'll see that in the movie this afternoon, that that was one of the problems. Well, the British had a man named Thomas Edward Lawrence, who would later become famous uh, under the name Lawrence of Arabia. T.E. Lawrence was not a British soldier to start with. He was an archaeologist. He had been trained in Britain, uh, at Oxford. He had traveled, however, all through the Middle East. He had explored various archaeological sites, he had traveled through the Sinai. There was probably no one, with the possible exception of a woman, I'll mention, there was possibly no one that knew this region better that the British could call on. So they recruit him to come to Egypt as a civilian consultant. And for a long time, what he was doing is making maps for them. Well, what happened is one day they asked him to go and brief a British general. And this British general, very stuffy British general, said, I am not going to take a briefing from some civilian. I will only take a briefing from an officer in the British Army. So they made him an officer. <laughs> so he had not gone to the usual training. They made him a lieutenant in the Army, and he did that briefing. That's why you see him in uniform. Um, Lawrence, from making maps, when they actually got the agreement with uh, Hussein bin Ali and the Arabs, he spoke Arabic. And so they sent him over there to, begin li to, to be a liaison. He and Faisal, the third son of Hussein bin Ali, who was the primary military leader, the one that was most effective, they related to each other. They connected. 
Lawrence did not relate well to Abdullah or to the oldest son, Hussein, who he thought was kind of useless. But he did relate to Faisal, and Faisal and he started working together, organizing the British, uh, the British effort through the Arab troops. Because he was traveling with, living with the people of um, the Arabs, then he began to dress like an Arab. He spoke their language. He accepted their culture. He, became, he went native, to use the old British expression, all right? Um, there's another a person that I want to mention to you in passing. Her name is Gertrude Bell. She is the one person, probably, who is British, who knew more about the Middle East than Lawrence of Arabia. Her uncle had been the British ambassador in Iran. She had lived in Tehran with her uncle for a while, and she learned to speak most of the languages of the region. In fact, she was fluent in Arabic, Persian, French, and German, and she also was comfortable in Italian and Turkish. She had traveled throughout this region, and to this day, Gertrude Bell, who became known as the Queen of the Desert, this is her with T.E. Lawrence, because they, they knew each other, they met on a number of occasions. They were both five feet, five inches tall. Um, so they could look eye to eye. <laughs> but Gertrude Bell was significantly responsible, not only as a consultant to the British, but she became a trusted confidant for quite a few of the leaders in the Arabic world at that time. She traveled across Arabia six times over a 12 year period, fluent in the language. She worked throughout the Middle East. She and Lawrence were particularly, now this was not a very comfortable place to be at this time. Both of them were known for having extraordinary physical endurance. They could ride camels for days at a time. Have you ever ridden a camel? I'd rather ride a bull that's bucking wild. A camel is a very uncomfortable animal to be on. And yet these two, at one point, T.E. Lawrence rode 1,300 miles on a camel in 30 days while suffering from malaria and from boils all over his back. He was so tough, some people have proposed that they thought he's actually masochistic. That he not only didn't mind the pain, but he kind of liked it. Well, Gertrude Bell was almost as tough. She traveled all over this region, and in a culture where women were not listened to, she was called La uh, Kadun, which means the queen who has eyes to help the state. She was significantly responsible for creating the archaeological museums in Iraq, she and T.E. Lawrence both were responsible for helping to, to defend the Hashemite right to rule, and both of them were very much against what the British did later on when they reneged on their promises. There's a movie coming out about Gertrude Bell this year, 2015. Uh, Nicole Kidman is starring as Gertrude Bell, and it's called Queen of the Desert, so keep your eyes out for that. I'm looking forward to seeing it. Um, she had various official positions with the British. Again, at one point she was called the most influential, the most powerful woman in the British Empire because of her effect in the Middle East. So, fascinating woman. How many of you had ever heard of Gertrude Bell before? Great! Half a dozen of you or so. You've read the right books. Um, so, what were they going to do in this Middle East? How were they going to fight back against the Ottomans? Well, once the Arabs, they declared war and they managed to put together at one time an army as large as 70,000, although the constant struggle was to try to keep them focused on fighting this war and not, you know, win a battle, take booty, and then go home. That's, um, that's much of what Lawrence was doing. One of the things that the Arabs wanted to do, the Ottomans had a fortress that they manned in Medina, the second holiest site in all Islam. Well, the Arabs really wanted to focus their energies on trying to throw the Ottomans out of Medina. But Lawrence, T.E. Lawrence convinced them not to do that for a very specific reason. There was a railroad that the Ottoman Empire had built called the Hejaz Railway from Damascus in Syria down through what we know of as Israel, down through major cities, all the way down to Medina. It was the only way they had of supplying their fortress and their troops in Medina. Well, T.E. Lawrence was smart enough to know as long as they have troops in a fortress there, they're going to have to try to supply them. So instead of attacking that fortress, they, he said, let's attack the railroad. Because every time they would attack this railroad, and, and there was one night where they planted over 500 explosive charges under this railroad that all went off about 2 a.m. That must have been quite a show. And so they would destroy several kilometers of this railway, and the, the Ottomans would have to send troops to 
engineers to try to fix it, but then also troops to protect them. They figured out that they could tie up a hundred to one to a thousand to one number of Turkish troops in trying to keep this railway working by not <laughs> driving the, the Ottoman soldiers out of Medina. So over the next several years, there was a huge focus on this railway and attacking it. You'll see that in the movie this afternoon if you've not seen the movie before. The headquarters for their efforts was at a town called Wej, here, and they, every day, every night, they would attack this railway. And every day, the Turkish would have to send out engineers and soldiers to protect those engineers to try to repair it again. And this went on for several years. The most important thing that Lawrence was able to accomplish, however, after considerable success, other than Medina, the only major uh, port, well, Medina wasn't a port, but the only major port that the Ottoman Empire still had effective control of was at the very north end of the Gulf of Aqaba. It was the city of Aqaba. We're going to be there in a few days. Aqaba was an Ottoman center. It was heavily fortified, but it was fortified against a sea attack. They had cannon there, but all of the cannons were pointed toward the water because they, the reason behind them, the Wadi Rum area, if you've heard of that, it was rough desert, rough mountains. The expectation was that no military force of sufficient size could come in behind Aqaba because the land is so difficult. Well, T.E. Lawrence was not one to accept limitations very easily. Instead of recommending that they attack from the water, which was well defended, Lawrence made arrangements to get a group of Arabic uh, warriors, camel warriors, to join with him, some British troops as well. They traveled inland and came in behind Aqaba and conquered the city from behind because they had even, even the various wadis, the various sort of um, valleys that, that came down to Aqaba, they had uh, pillboxes, they had soldiers posts there. But all of them were pointed down toward the water. And so they could just walk up behind them and, and none of the guns were pointed in the direction to the back. They conquered Aqaba, and in doing so, they ended up creating a port. They did two things. One, they created a port that they could bring goods in here, and then the British Army, by this time General Allenby had taken over. General Allenby had, had in Egypt, they had put together the primary British force that they intended to invade this way. Well, as long as Aqaba was there and they could provide for the Ottoman troops in here, in Jordan and in Palestine, it wasn't called Israel at that point, then there was always a danger that as they crossed the Sinai Peninsula, across the Suez Canal, that they would be in danger from, from one side, that there would be troops there. Well, when they conquered Aqaba and started bringing in troops by ship, bringing in supplies by ship, they not only had a port that they could be bringing in their own provisions, but they were protecting the British Expeditionary Force from any attack from the, uh, the east. So critically important that they were able to do that. General Allenby um, was a huge supporter of uh, T.E. Lawrence, gave him free hand. He said, you know, when he, after Allenby took over, the previous British generals had not done very well. Allenby was very successful. And he just said to Lawrence, you know what you're doing. I like what you're doing. You know, let me know if you need any help. Otherwise, you're on your own. I mean, you know, go do what you want to do. And Lawrence was very uh, successful in that. At the same time all of this was happening, dun, 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 dun. have you guys ever heard of the Sykes-Picot Agreement? You will remember that in January of 1916, there was the final agreement between the British government, as represented by, uh, by McMahon, the primary emissary or representative of the British government in the Middle East, and Hussein bin Ali, that they would give an Arab homeland to the Arabs if they fought for the British. Five months later, there was an agreement signed between the um, British government, represented by Sir Charles or Sir Mark Sykes, and a French <laughs> official named Francois Georges Picot. It became known as the Sykes Picot Agreement, um, and or technically the Asia Minor Statement, and it said that if they won the war, if they defeated the Ottoman Empire, that France and Britain would divide up the valuable parts of the Middle East between the two of them. It was an absolute negation of the promise that had been made to the Arabs, and it was secret. The Russians 
were aware of it. They were involved in the discussions. And what happened is after the Russian Revolution, the Bolsheviks who took over in Russia found out about this and they publicized it to, to the embarrassment, horrendous embarrassment of the British. The French aren't embarrassed by anything. But the horrific <laughs> embarrassment of the, of the British to the delight of the Turks and to the dismay of the Arabs. Nobody knew quite what to deal with this. Still, Hussein, who had been declared king of the Hejaz, independent from the Ottoman Empire, he continued to say to his sons, we can trust the British. We can trust the British. The British will keep their word. Whatever they're saying about that, the British can be trusted. Remember, this is what was promised to the Arabs if they fought for the British. This is what happened. When they actually won the war and they carved up the Ottoman Empire, the French took over French Lebanon, which was called the French Mandate because the League of Nations was formed right at the end of the First World War, and the League of Nations approved this. So the French took over Lebanon and Syria. The British took over Palestine, Transjordan, which later was named Jordan, and Iraq. Now there's a reason why they wanted this. In the 1912, before the start of the First World War, the Lord of the Admiralty, does anybody know who the uh, first Lord of the Admiralty was in the First World War? Churchill. Churchill, Winston Churchill, in 1912 had declared that the British Navy, the largest Navy in the world, was going to convert from coal power to petroleum oil power. Well, Britain had lots of coal, still do, they have no oil. The primary place they were getting oil was from Persia. From the, very, from the very earliest time. And they were reliant, they had already, by the, the First World War, they had become reliant upon Middle Eastern oil. And so the British were very concerned that they take over control of areas like modern day Iraq, which was the British mandate of Iraq, so that they would have guaranteed access to oil. This is another image of the same thing. The French mandate of Syria, the French mandate of Lebanon, British mandate of Mesopotamia or Iraq, and the British Mandate of Palestine. So they simply lied to Hussein to get his troops to fight for them, or his people to fight for them. Not long after that, in 1917, we have the British making the Balfour Declaration. Remember, two years before this, they had promised that all of this would be an Arab nation. On the 2nd of December in 1917, Arthur James Balfour, who was the U United Kingdom, or Brit Great Britain's Foreign Secretary, issued a letter which, this is one paragraph from the letter, it says, His Majesty's government views with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this objective, it being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which might prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine. Basically, they said, Britain is in favor of there being a Jewish nation there. And the Arabs are going, wait a minute! You told us that was going to be our property. Despite the protests of his son, King Hussein bin Ali said, you can trust the British. In fact, he made statements that affirmed the fact that the Jewish people had been persecuted for millennia and that they would welcome Jewish communities in the territory that would become the Arab homeland. It, he was completely open to the Jewish people coming there, and he s expressed sympathy for the persecution they'd experienced. But the assumption was that they would be part of the larger homeland of the Arabs, not that it would get carved up. The reason the British did this, it was not so much out of sympathy for the Jewish people. And by the way, the letter that was written initially was to Baron uh, Walter Rothschild, who was a, a leader of the British Zionist movement. He was involved in this. Why did the British do this? It wasn't just out of the goodness of their heart. They were, we were still in a stalemate in the First World War, and the British were saying, we need all the help we can get. The Jewish communities around the world, and there are a couple of aspects of this, the Jewish communities had a lot of financial resources. There were a lot of bankers, like Rothschild. And so we get them on our side, we've got additional resources. If we can get the Russian Jews siding more with their government, <laughs> And the, the Russian Jews were not real keen on the Russian government. You remember the pogroms and all that stuff? But if we can make some statement like this and get the Jewish populations of those countries on our side, that will help. But most especially, at the start of the First World War, 
the United States President Woodrow Wilson had declared absolute neutrality. We will not get involved in this conflict in Europe. That changed in 1917 because the German submarines started sinking more and more and more American ships. And so because of that, Carolyn's reading a book right now about the Lusitania, mm -hmm. right? Eventually, the U.S. government got involved, and Woodrow Wilson said, we're going to join this battle in order to make the world safe for democracy. That's where that expression comes from. But the reason why Balfour and the British government made the pro-Jewish statements, one of the reasons, was because the two most important and influential advisors to President Woodrow Wilson was Louis Brandeis and Felix Frankfurter. Those were his two closest advisors. They're both Jewish, and they were both pro-Zionist, meaning they were in favor of establishing a Jewish homeland. So the British government thought, if we can get those two advisors to Woodrow Wilson liking us agreeing to have a Jewish homeland in Palestine, then they might influence Woodrow Wilson to come into the war. There's no indication that ended up being true, but they thought it might be. And so, again, the Arabs are dealing with what appeared to be a contradiction from the British. But King Hussein bin Ali continued to say, you can trust the British. You can trust the British. And we're okay with this. The Jews can live there in peace with us. 1918, the war ends. And through a series of things. With all of the stalemate that continued into 1918 on the Western Front, the Germans decided to try a completely new tactic, using small groups of stormtroopers with light machine guns and flamethrowers, supported by uh, not just these massive barrages of the, the way they were doing it earlier is they would have massive barrage, sometimes for days or even a week at a time, and then they'd stop it, then the troops would come up out of the trenches. So what happened is, the people that they were, they were the artillery was trying to affect, they had deep bunkers, they'd go in the bunkers, and they'd just wait until the artillery stopped, and then they'd come up knowing that these guys are going to start coming out, and we've got our machine gun, guns ready. It was, I'm sorry, but stupid. It, it was insane the way they were doing this. Well, the Germans tried to, a new tactic as sort of a last-ditch effort because they were having, it, it was such a horrendous thing, they were having mutinies, people were deserting the army, so they started a 100-day offensive on the Western Front with a very different tactic. But unfortunately, they exhausted themselves, these small groups of stormtroopers, where the expression comes from, ended up outrunning their lines of supply, and that ground to a halt. When that halted, with all the problems that Germany was having in the military with mutinies and things of that sort, the Allies fought back. They ended up breaking through the Hindenburg Line in September of 1918. The last Turkish offensive was at the same time period, August to September of 1918. On September 19th to 25th, the, Palace, the uh, British Army under Allenby, with the support of the Arab troops that T.E. Lawrence was leading, conquered Palestine. Right after that, they were able to conquer Damascus, the capital of Syria, which was a main center point in that whole region. Damascus was the key to the whole Syrian Mesopotamian area in terms of the Ottoman Empire. In effect, the Ottoman Empire was defeated at that point. In September 30th, Bulgaria, the first of the central powers, signs an armistice with the Allies. October 30th, the Ottoman Empire officially signs the Armistice of Mudros, which means they weren't going to fight anymore. Austro-Hungary signs an armistice with Italy on November 3rd. They wouldn't sign an armistice with the other allies, but Italy they would. It's sort of like you know, the, least, the least damaging. On November 9th, Kaiser Wilhelm II abdicates, and the Weimar Republic, or Weimar Republic, just pronounce it in German, was declared the first German Republic. November 10th, the Austro-Hungarian Kaiser, Charles I, abdicates in the same way that the war was boom, 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 and then everybody was at war. Very quickly, everything ended. Everything you know, caved in on the Central Powers. November 11th, at 5 a.m., Germany signed the Armistice of Compiègne, and that same day, at 11 a.m., hostilities ceased. Part of the insanity of this war is that people continued to kill each other up until the last minute of the uh, hostilities. They had signed the armistice earlier, the word had already gone out, but they still had, especially, um, there was a Canadian who was killed at 10.57. See, the war ended at the 11th, uh, the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month. The 11th of November, 11 a.m. And yet they continued to have people attacking the lines of the other sides right up until the last minute. And there were people being killed right up until the last minute, even though they knew the war was going to end at 11 o'clock. Just some of the insanity. Um, 
November 12th, Austria is proclaimed a republic. And then in 1919, we have the Paris Peace Conference in which they ratified the various kinds of treaties that they had had and they decided what are they going to do with the conquered territories. And June 28th is the Treaty of Versailles in, in, outside Paris where they finalized some of the breaking up of all this. This is what the war looked like, the price of war. The Allied powers had 42 million men in their armies, 5 million were killed, 12.8 million were wounded, 4 million were missing and never recovered, assumed dead. 22 million total casualties, or 52% of everybody who fought in that war was either dead or wounded. The Central Powers lost 67% in dead or wounded, and they, only mo they mobilized a lot fewer. So in total, 65 million people fought, 8.5 million dead, 21 million wounded, 7.7 .7 million missing, total casualties 37 million or 57% of everybody that fought. Um, and it's, it's estimated that the civilian dead were almost that many, between 6 and 7 million. This is a picture that was taken at the Paris Peace Treaty. It is Faisal, who became not only, he's the third son of Hussein bin Ali. He not only became the primary spokesperson for the Arab world at that point, but he's accompanied by a number of his entourage, including Lawrence of Arabia, who was asked to join him for this. It was during this time that they became aware, again, the League of Nations is formed, and they became aware, the Arab world became aware of the fact that they were not going to honor their promises. And they argued against it, they fought against it, and not literally fought against it, but you know, did everything they could. T.E. Lawrence, Gertrude Bell, others who had been involved in this, who hated what the British government was doing now, the British and the French. In fact, the book, uh, Lawrence in Arabia, starts out with the scene where T.E. Lawrence was invited to, uh, to an event. He comes in and discovers that the king and queen of England are there. The queen had come along because she wanted to meet this man who had become very famous by then. And they're going to knight him. He refuses. They had never had that happen before. T.E. Lawrence refused to accept a knighthood. In fact, later on, there were a number of, of major medals. He ended up as a full colonel. He never went to military training, but he ended up a full colonel in the military. He left the, the army. He had received all these awards. And he very famously, for instance, he received the top award for a non-French soldier that can be given by the French government. He pinned it to his dog's collar and his dog wore it around. <laughs> he had complete disdain for this whole thing because his government had lied outright and he had been the one that had been promising all along to the Arab peoples that this is going to be okay. He refused a knighthood. Um, this is what the Middle East ended up looking like. From the Ottoman Empire before uh, 1914 when the war started, you have Arabia is, in, is independent, uh, Kuwait, Yemen, over the next number of years, Egypt, uh, a lot of these places declared their independence, but you still had, uh, up until the 1940s in most cases, you had uh, the mandates of the French and the British. Now the British actually apparently felt kind of bad about this. We have records that have been released even in recent years that some of the, the British uh, the British Prime Minister and others expressed real doubts and concerns over the fact they promised this and now they had reneged on their promise. Hussein bin Ali, who had been named the King of the Hejaz, um, was under attack by Abdul Aziz Ibn Saud. I'll show you his picture in a minute. So he stepped off the, the throne and gave his son, his oldest son, Ali bin Hussein, the, the throne of king. He was only on that throne for about a year before they were defeated. They were conquered by the forces of Ibn Saud and his family who took over almost all of Saudi Arabia with the exception of the very southern end of the peninsula, which became Yemen, eventually Yemen and Oman. The middle son became the emir by the efforts of the British government, became first emir, which meant prince of Jordan, and then later was made the king of Jordan. The British put him in place there. The third son, the one that had been most significant during the war, Faisal bin Hussein bin Ali al-Hashimi, just known as Faisal, he was made king of Syria. Remember Damascus, Syria, was the center of Mesopotamia. He was the king for less than a year when the, the French marched in with their army and defeated an army of Syrian Arabs, a small army, and threw Faisal out of the country and took over. So they, by force of arms, defied the Arab peoples who had been promised this land. Well, later on, 
again, the British recognized the unfairness of this. They made Faisal the king of Iraq, and he was the king of Iraq from 1921 to 1933. This is before the Shah and all of that kind of stuff. Um, this is uh, uh, Abdulaziz ibn Saud, the first king of Saudi Arabia. He first took control of the Naj, which is Central Arabia, and then in the 1920s he defeated the Hash uh, Hashemite family and took over the Hejaz, Mecca, Medina, all of that area. This is still the royal family that is in control of Saudi Arabia. In fact, it was called Arabia before when the family Saud, ibn Saud means the son of Saud, when the family Saud took over most of the Arabian Peninsula, it became Saudi Arabia because of the family name. And so this is what it looks like today. Iran, Iraq, Syria, Turkey. Uh, another interesting story is that after all of the breaking up of the land, the Allies decided, well, we're also going to split Turkey up in pieces and take parts of it. <laughs> well, Mustafa Kemal, who later was called Ataturk, said, no, you're not. And the, uh, the government authorities in Turkey had, were ready to give in. And he said no, he left the capital of Constantinople and moved to Ankara. That's why Ankara is now the capital, because he left the capital and moved his forces and the people that supported him to Ankara. The allies came in, not the big guys, it was the smaller, the smaller allies put together a force and came in and they were going to conquer Turkey and split it up. He fought them and defeated them, the War of Independence for Turkey, and created the new Turkey. He changed their alphabet, he changed their style of dress, he knew that in order to relate to a modern world, he had to be able to relate to the West. And so he changed everything about that country. And today, Turkey is one of the most solid, except for the new president, Ergenin, um, is one of the most solid and successful countries in the world. They're completely independent, they don't have to import any food, etc. So, Lawrence of Arabia, T.E. Lawrence. He left the, the military in disgust, but he missed it. He had always said he hated the military. He never planned on being in the military in the first place. But after he had been out for a while, he missed the sort of discipline of it. So knowing that he was famous and that he couldn't just go back in, he changed his name. He actually applied under a name called John Hume Ross to become part of the RAF, the Royal Air Force. He enlisted as an enlisted person in the RAF. Later on, they found out he lied about his name, and so they threw him out of the RAF. He tried several times to get back in. When he couldn't get back in there, he then applied to the Armored Corps of the military in Britain under the name T.E. Shaw, the Royal Tank Corps. He was, he was admitted. He was unhappy there. He eventually left there. And on 19th of May, 1935, actually five days before that, uh, he loved motorcycles. He loved adventure. This was his favorite motorcycle. It was called uh, a Bra Superior SS100, which he called George V. <laughs> well, he was riding his motorcycle, and this is the opening scene of the movie this afternoon. And he was riding his motorcycle in the English Country Road, and he came over a, over a rise, and there were two boys on bicycles. He swerved to avoid the boys. He ended up crashing. He was hospitalized and he died five days later. One interesting little side note is the doctor that treated T.E. Lawrence, and he was very famous by then. I mean, that's why he couldn't try to get back in the military under his own name. He was very famous. The doctor that treated him after that did a lot of study and research about the effect of head injury from motorcycle accidents, and that was what led to the, hel the first helmet laws in the world for motorcycle riders, was the death of T.E. Lawrence. This issue of Lawrence of Arabia, of the Sykes-Picot Agreement, of the lie that was told to the Arabic people, still makes the news. Last year, the Turkish president, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, and Erdogan's kind of a loose cannon in this part of, this part of the world. You know, uh, he has really up, caused an upheaval that did not exist in Turkey before him. He declared that Lawrence of Arabia was, quote, a bigger enemy than ISIS. He blamed Lawrence of Arabia for the Sykes-Picot Agreement and the lie that had been made to the Arab world, even though they're not Arabs, they're Turks. Um, even though Lawrence of Arabia completely disagreed with this and fought against it, so his history is really bad. But ISIL, or ISIS, uh, whatever, whichever name you choose to use, they have done, you might know that they used uh, the digital media a lot. They've used uh, videos online and Facebook and all kinds of stuff. That's one of the ways they've unfortunately been able to recruit people is through the electronic media. They have done videos in which they declare the end of the Sykes-Picot Agreement as they blow up 
various guard stations between borders that were established after the First World War. They are still referring to the Sykes-Picot Agreement. That is considered the turning point in Western and Middle Eastern relations, and we have never recovered from the effects of that lie. That's Lawrence of Arabia, the Bedouins, and an Allied victory in the First World War. Are there any questions? Anything? Yes? Right. Okay, the Kurds. The Kurds are a distinct ethnic group. In fact, they exist in several places, especially northern Iraq, northern Iran. They are Muslim, but as a particular ethnic group, they have been sort of on the outs. In fact, right now, um, they don't have their own country, although they are called a protectorate within a couple of the other countries. In our, the West at least recognizes them as having some right to independent entity, but they are not their own country. Uh, the Kurds have had a very rich history. In fact, uh, Saladin, the guy who introduced the, you know, who got rid of the, um, the caliphate and introduced the uh, Ayyubid dynasty, he was Kurdish. And so the Kurds have had an important place in history. They are a distinct ethnic group. They are Islamic. So they're not Christian, okay? Yes? You talked about all the tribes, how the tribes fought against each other. Had the, had the Sykes-Picot Agreement not been implemented, it would have been an even broader set of tribes within that area, and we did have a turnover of government that occurred in Saudi Arabia. Do you have right. any thoughts about the ability to have held together in that area? Well, they would not have made it any worse. Again, the, tr the <laughs> tribes were fighting within the boundaries of the country that they were in, but they, it's not like they were trying to, there was not one tribe trying to take over the others. They just had animosity. One of the early scenes in the movie you're going to see this afternoon is there's a, a fellow at a well, an Arabic man. Another Arabic guy comes up, and from a distance he shoots him. And when Lawrence, well, T. Lawrence says, why did you do that? And he goes, he's not from my tribe. He doesn't have a right to my water. You know, so there was always that kind of animosity, that kind of antagonism, but it was not at a national scale. There's no indication if they had become one Arabic nation, that doesn't mean there was going to be any more trouble than they would have had anyway um, when, when it was controlled by Ottomans or anybody else. So I don't think that would have, you know, that would have not itself created a problem. Yes? The Kurds, Shiite, Sunni, what, other kind of Islam? The Kurds, it, it's always difficult to say, you know, this is the... There's no hard lines. I mean, even Iran, which is known as the, you know, the the largest predominant Shia, there's ten percent of them are are Sunni. There's no hard lines anywhere. The Kurds are predominantly um, Sunni. I don't know what percentage of them might be something else, but they're predominantly Sunni. Other questions? Even if it's been since the 1960s that you saw the movie, come and see it this afternoon, hopefully, and, and I recommend that book to you, and maybe between these different things you'll get a good sense of what happened then, because that set the stage for everything since then that's happened in the Middle East, including the animosities between them and the West, some of the difficulties within, how the countries got created and carved up, all of that is part of it. Yes? What's that? Uh, he was 46 when he died, so he was not an old man. He could not have done some of the things he did if he'd been old. Thank you all very much, and enjoy the movie session.